Hi, George. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for those who uh, joined us already. And uh, thank you for uh, um, the panel that um, are actually online at the moment. Uh, we'll, we'll give um, each one about uh, five minutes uh, until everyone signs in. In the meantime, um, we will probably uh, play um, a spiritual song whilst we're waiting for everyone to join. And then after that, we will go through um, the, the, the plan for the, after, for the evening. Kareem, would it be possible to play a song? Yes, yeah, sure. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
Thank you, Karim. Uh, I think we have got about uh, 34 people uh, in the meeting, and it's uh, five past seven. So I think I think we should pray. Um, may I invite uh, Ihab? Could you could you please share a, a, a short prayer for us to start the meeting, please? Possible Abuna Michael, if we're able to open it up for him, would that be possible? Sorry, Asha. Uh, Abuna Michael, okay. I hear you now. Sorry, I, I, I didn't even see Abuna is there. It's okay. Sorry. Father Abuna. Okay. Then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lord, I ask you, Lord, first of all, let us thank God for everything you gave us throughout the years. Thank you, God, because you gave us this time to spend with you to talk about a very important topic, Lord. Lord, give the speaker the wisdom, give him the strength to, so he can actually reach to each one's heart, Lord. God, we're coming here just to listen to your word, to your wisdom. So we ask you to send this wisdom through Professor George, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to accept our prayers through the intercession of St. Mary and Archangel Michael and the prayers of all saints. Hear us, Lord, when we say to you, thankfully and joyfully, our Father, who art in heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, design the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Me. Thank you, Abuna. You should Sally. Thank you, everyone. Um, just a couple of uh, points before we start. A uh, few housekeeping uh, points. Um, um, we would like George to uh, carry on with his presentation as uh, continuous, uh, without without interruptions, just to to get to get all the ideas across. So, if you have got any questions, uh, you will find at the bottom of your screen a Q and A icon. Please click on that Q and A icon and write any question you have. At the end of the uh, presentation, we will actually collect. Uh, we'll look at all these questions and we'll assign them to various people to answer. So that's the first point. The second point is uh, we have been blessed by uh, Dr. Fadi. Now is going to do uh, some translation for us. So if you would like to actually follow the session in Arabic, uh, please make sure that you click on the Arabic icon at the bottom right corner of your screen. And when you do so, uh, please make sure that you mute all uh, audio. And also, um, you, you, might, you might be asked to, to update your uh, Zoom client, but if, if you are asked to do that, just click on the update quickly and um, uh, to get the interpretation, click on the bottom icon and don't forget to mute original audio. Otherwise, you will be hearing the translation as well as the, the, the spoken English and you will get uh, confused. Um, so that's, that's it uh, with regards to the housekeeping. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. George Basilius. We welcome you to our uh, gathering um, this evening and tomorrow. We thank you for making the time. We know that... Um, we are taking a um, very valuable time of your weekend, um, but uh, we are always very, very blessed and, and happy to, to have you with us, to share with us your um, knowledge and, and experience about the topic. Um, we might be joined uh, by uh, Sayyidina Mangelos um, in, in, in due course. I think he's stuck somewhere in traffic or somewhere. I'm not 100% sure. But as uh, soon as he joins, um, we will welcome him as well. Um, with just a couple of a couple of points on the on the topic that we we chose, um, the the seminar is organized by um, Code UK. Uh, when we were trying to think about um, what to cover, it was essentially focused on servants, on, on servants in our church, those people who are constantly working with our youth, either either uh, secondary or primary. And uh, we were thinking about what is it that, that we would offer the servants in a, in a relatively short period of time, which is a couple of hours and two evenings. Um, and by God's grace, we kind of uh, 
all agreed on, on a couple of, of important topics. We all felt that actually in our world today, with all the pressures and all the, the challenges that we're having in society, um, we need to continue to engage effectively with young people. And, and there are two key factors to that engagement. One is about understanding and, and understanding where they are coming from, what their concerns are, what they are being exposed to and so on, and how do we get to them and reach them. So that was the first topic which we'll cover this evening. And the second one was, okay, if we are able to actually engage with them, reach them and, and actually um, establish a relationship, how do we then in a simple way communicate our faith uh, succinctly and effectively? So we, we consulted with Dr. Basilius and, and he was, um, more than happy to, to share with us his uh, thoughts on the two top, uh, on the two subjects. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Dr. George. Thank you very much, Ashraf, um, and thank you everyone for this uh, blessed opportunity to meet with you again. It's always a privilege to be with my very dear friends, the Coat team, whom I consider is uh, you know a, a beacon of. Um, of apologetics and the theological education in not just in London, but all over the world. So I am blessed to be with you. I see your, um, um, you know, Fadi, Ihab and Kareem and, and my fathers. Um, happy to see you virtually. And I look forward to seeing you face to face personally, hopefully in the near future. I hope so. Um, and as Ashraf mentioned, first, first and foremost, absolve me, our fathers, please. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God. Go ahead. Go ahead and pray for me, please. Um, first and foremost, uh, I, um, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's a privilege to be with you. Learned, learned a great deal from you when I, when I met with you last, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. As Ashraf mentioned, the first session will be on Generation Z, um, understanding and reaching our current generation. And then the second subject, um, God willing, tomorrow will be how to communicate the essentials of our Christian faith in a simplified way that the audience may um, absorb and digest the essentials of our Christian faith. So Gen Z, um, what is, what's the objective? Why are we discussing Generation Z? Well, we need to identify and understand the value systems and the behaviors and the mindset of this new generation. Why? So that we can gracefully shepherd them into the kingdom. Now there's a three prong approach and the three step process. Um, and I will share my screen so that we can all follow. The three step process is such is that we need to first influence well, not first, I should say we need to ultimately rather influence this generation, positively influence them. But for us to influence anyone, we must communicate with them. We must have a discourse with the audience, the other person. Well, for us to communicate, we must understand. So if you understand this generation, you'll be able to communicate with them. And when you communicate with them, you can positively influence them into the kingdom. So this is why we're doing what we're doing, so that we can understand this next generation. So let's talk about Gen Z. Who are they? Let's define who are the generation, who, who's this generation? Um, they're born from 1995 to 2009, 2010. So you can see um, the, you know, you're, in your, in your late teens, early teens, late teens, maybe early 20s, this is the generation that we have uh, that we're focusing on this evening. Gen Z is also known as the internet generation. There are different aliases and different names for this generation. The I generation, they're also called the I gen. And they're also called um, generation now or the Google generation or the selfie generation. And lastly, they're also called the post millennials 
because they have basically come following the millennial generation. Since they have born some very interesting factoids, since I have been born, hybrid cars have always existed. Google has always existed. They've never licked a, post a postage stamp in their life. They don't even know what a postage stamp is or what it looks like. Wi-Fi is always there and it's an entitlement. They've never seen an answering machine. They don't know what an answering machine is. They don't even know what a VCR means. And I'm sure that many of us, the older generation, understand what I'm referring to. Lastly, they have never seen a cassette tape. They don't even know what that is. And I'm speaking by experience because my son, who's 16, has asked me these questions. I've done, they've seen cassette tapes in my garage and they say, well, what is this? And what? how do you play this? Anyways, this is just to give you a quick introduction as to what is Gen Z. Gen Z in the composition of this generation, it's now the largest single population segment in the world. You can see now that they moved, they surpassed the millennials by 4%. Now the 26% of the world's population is comprised of Gen Z, Generation Z. All right, let's see what the, some of the scholars who spent uh, several years studying Gen Z and the, uh, James White, he has written a book called Meet Generation Z, Understanding and Reaching the New Post-Christian World. In his book, he has, he has written, Gen Z is the youngest and largest generational cohort on the planet. This means that in the coming years, they will not simply influence culture, listen to this, they will be the culture. This makes them the most pressing generation to study. They will be the most influential, influential religious force in the West and the heart of the challenge facing the Christian church. This is precisely why we're discussing the attributes and characteristics of Gen Z this evening. He goes on to say, the speed of culture in which change can happen in a day will make speaking of generations and their characteristics obsolete. In the future, it will be less about what a difference a generation makes, but more about what a difference a day makes. And you can see the exponential speed that things are just have been changing from, I wouldn't say from, like, like he said, from a decade to, to, to another decade, but from you know, almost weekly, daily, as he said. Well, a 14 year old, I would say um, in, 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 nine, in 2015, inhabits a completely different world than in 2005, completely different world. And if you have uh, children, you will notice that, you'll see that you see your 15 year old and your 10 year old, they speak different languages. They have different, completely different um, perspectives on the world and so on and so forth. So what are the attributes? And I'm gonna go over just to make this easy and, and, and relative as well. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna discuss six or seven, it depends on time six or seven key characteristics of this generation. As I go through each one of them, I will, um, I will end with the, um, the result of this characteristic. And what do we do in order to bridge this gap or in order to effectively communicate so that we can positively influence, as we said. So we'll go over six or seven, depending on time again, of these characteristics. Number one, they are Wi-Fi enabled. Wi-Fi and, and for, for servants, um, this is very, again, very important for us to understand so that we can be able to communicate and influence. What do I mean by Wi-Fi enabled? Well, uh, sociologists have said that Gen Z is the product of the fourth great communication revolution. The first was language. This is how you communicate with the other. The second um, communication revolution was writing. 
you've kind of you know graduated from language to writing okay now you've communicated through letters the third step or stage was now typing and i'm sure you can all guess what the fourth stage is it's the electronic coding of information also known as texting now if you have a 12 year old 14 15 16 even 18 year old you don't call them on the phone anymore at least here in the us and canada you text them they you call them they will not answer you they will talk and communicate by or or communicate rather by by texting this is the generation or the first generation to be raised in the era of smartphones they basically learn how to swipe before they learn how to talk this is the generation um, uh, gen z that i'm referring to some other key statistics they spend nine hours per day absorbing media 91 percent of gen zers go to bed and wake up with their device in their hand so that's the reason why um, again sociologists call them screen agers not just teenagers but screen agers and as a matter of fact there's an interesting um uh, small video um if you go to screenagersmovie.com and you'll see the evolution of gen z and you know the the screen living through screens and so on and so forth it's an interesting video clip that you may want to check out it's again you can see the reference here on the screen uh, www.screenagersmovie.com so this is an attribute or characteristics what's the result well the result is that they get undiscerning flood of information well there's a lot of knowledge out there a lot of information out there and they're basically like sponges absorbing all this information but sometimes most times it, you know with, with no filter with no discernment we as servants need to understand that how can we create filtering system, discernment, exercise discern, teach them how to discern truth from falsehood. Another result is that the, the, the line between the virtual and the real has now become, um, become you know, almost non-existent because I can construct for myself a persona, uh, a profile on social media that will convey to the world some someone who is very different from the real me so the virtual i live my life virtually not so much in reality another result as you can see on the screen that we begin to live disconnected lives and how many of us have gone to out to eat in restaurants or and and you'll see a family that they're all all four or five of them they're on their mobile devices because they you know they have this um you know wi-fi entitlement to this living through screens living through virtual realities and so on and so forth so this is the very first attribute that they're wi-fi enabled the second attribute is that, that they're multiracial and diverse what do i mean by that let me share with you some statistics um npr released uh, uh, some reports indicating that gen z is the most racially and ethnically diverse, and this is as of November 2018. Over half of Gen Z will identify as mixed race by 2020. And in, uh, in the EU, and wanted to make this as specific to Europe and to England as much as possible, this generation, and I'm quoting a study that was done, and here's the reference for the study at the bottom of the page, this generation is the most diverse in terms of origins as well in luxembourg for example the share of foreign-born children in the zero to 14 age group was the highest in the eu in 2019 with one fifth born outside the national territory in ireland is the same way in austria and you can see in this study that europe has become more and more and more diverse and this generation has become more and more multiracial and ethnically diverse. More likely, they're more likely than their parents 
to wed someone of an other ethnic group. I did take permission, by the way, from this couple to show their picture. They were married in our church. One in five marriages today is interracial. In 1980, the rate was fewer than one in 10. Multiracial, diverse. What does that mean as a result? You'll see that the blue screens is basically what we need to react to. Well, as a result, here is a, a worldview that has been seeping into this generation. If diversity is encouraged, if diversity is promoted, if it is celebrated on earth, then it should also be promoted, encouraged, celebrated in heaven. Meaning, why do I think that only Christians will go to heaven? This is so narrow-minded. This is just so too exclusive. It is not very tolerant and obviously not very politically correct. So Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, as, lo as long as you're a good person, you will go to heaven. And then you can see the sign of co we, co we coexist on this planet. We're, we're, we're diverse on this planet. So heaven must also be diverse. You can see the challenge now. All religions worship the same God. Diversity is promoted also in heaven. And Christianity, as, I, as you see on the screen, is one of many paths to heaven. Again, hence the challenge. A third characteristic of this generation, and we said two so far, they're um, glued to their screen because they're always connected, Wi-Fi enabled, screen agers. Number two, they're multiracial and, and ethnically diverse, uh, far more than previous generations. That's what I mean to say. Number three, they're relativists. They're relativists. What do I mean by that? Well, facts don't matter. And I'm, I'm quoting uh, one of our um, Hollywood famous people here in, in the US, Stephen Colbert, uh, talk show host. Um, uh, he, he says, facts don't matter. The, 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 what, what matters is how you feel. And if it feels good, then it must be good. You are the final decision maker of what is true and what is false. Hence, being a relativist. You know, the post, the, I mean, uh, the Oxford Dictionary word of the year in 2016 was post-truth. In other words, truth no longer exists. We live in a world that has surpassed this notion, this traditional, narrow-minded notion of truth. We live in what's called post-truth world. Um, and if you want to look at the actual definition of what post-truth is, according to Oxford Dictionary, Word of the Year 2016, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts, objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. You can see the danger of this movement and this, and this trend. As a result of being a relativist and no truth, what's the result? Well, when you get rid of true and false, you tend to get rid of right and wrong. That's why sin doesn't exist. We don't sin. We simply make mistakes that can be corrected. That's why amongst this generation, many of, of, of Gen Zers will say that we're not sinners. We may be mistakers. And of course, as a result, the indulgence in immorality because there's no sin. And if there's no sin, there's no hell. And I'll show you again, if there's no sin, there's ev then everything becomes virtuous. You cannot say this is wrong and this is right. Why? Because truth doesn't exist. You make up your own truth. You become a relativist and you ascribe to what we know, of course, as moral relativism, religious uh, relativism as well. Lust will take a, a, a better name, sensuality. Pornography will become a form of art. Homosexuality becomes alternative lifestyle. Anger 
will become being honest with your emotions. I'm not angry. I'm just being in touch with who I am, with my feelings. Greed will become pursuing your dreams. And you can see so, you know, so on and so on. Because there's no sin, everything is virtuous. And I'm just adding some verses down here just so that we can um, relate this back to the scriptures. Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. As I said, if there's no sin, then there's no hell. Elizabeth Gilbert, she's an author, biographer, and novelist, um, commonly referred to. She says, if there's no such a thing in the universe, uh, there is no such a thing in the universe as hell except maybe in our own terrified minds. Those Christians use this notion of hell to scare people to do what they want them to do. Why? Because there's no sin. Why? Because everything's relative. So Wi-Fi enabled screen agers, multiracial, uh, ethnically diverse, um, relativists, and number four, sexually fluid and gender neutral sexually fluid and gender neutral by the way all these characteristics that i'm sharing with you um, they're not exclusive to gen zers because you'll see patterns in the millennials and generation x and in older generations but the concentration of these characteristics reside within the, the this cohort Generation Z from 1999 to 2010 and so on that were born in that in that era. What do I mean by sexually fluid and gender neutral? Well, let's look at some statistics that will um, illustrate what I mean here. Um, there is a survey and a question that states uh, that goes on as, as it, it is acceptable for someone to be born one gender and to feel like another gender. Well, let's look at the responses. Engage Christians on the left and on the right, you'll see all Gen Zers. 41% of Gen Zers said, definitely it's acceptable for someone to be born one gender and feel like another. 28% said probably, 9% said probably not, 10% said not sure. 41% said definitely it is acceptable, whereas engaged Christians, practicing Christians said only 16%. Um, I have so many quotes, but I just, I'll spare you the quotes. And again, for the, in the interest of time, I will skip some of those. But these are some celebrities that Gen Zers look at as, um, you know, moral mentors or, you know, moral, you know, guides. Um, Miley Cyrus, an American singer, famous American singer and songwriter and actress. She says, everything that's legal, I'm down with. I'm down with any adult, anyone over the age of 18 who's down to love me. I don't relate to being a bo being boy or girl, and I don't have to have my partner relate to boy or girl. Angelina Jolie, an American actress and a filmmaker, she wants to be, she's speaking about her child, she said, she wants to be a boy, so we had to cut her hair. She likes to wear boys everything. You don't know who your children are until they show you who they are. They're just becoming whoever they want to be. Let's make this a gender fluid generation so that you know, you're no longer, you know, fit into this binary, either boy or girl. Why limit yourself to the gender that was given to you? Why don't you choose your own? Why, why, why can't you have this, in, you know, personal freedom? By the way, this is part of a movement that's called expressive individualism. And I wish you can Google this expression because it's becoming a rapidly increasing movement in the West, expressive individualism. I wanna be me. And there's an expression here in the US that says, that goes, I do me, you do you. I'm not sure if this is the same in, 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 uh, in England. Um, 
uh, here it is. The greatest value of just generation has become, again, expressive individualism. Not only do I feel like I am X, but I need to express that to the world. They need to know, they need to see it. And not only do they need to know it and see it, but they need to agree with me. And if they don't, they are becoming detrimental to my life and to society at large. Uh, the Telegraph. This was, I believe, um, a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if the date is on this report. But anyway, you can look it up online. Nearly half of young people in this cohort of Gen Z do not think they are exclusively heterosexual. 94% um, of people aged between 18 and 24 identify as something other than 100% heterosexual. And you can see, again, the sexual fluidity of this, uh, of this cohort and this generation. As a result, now what? Keep in mind, I give you, I give you the, 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 the attribute and then of course the outcome, the result. Well, you'll see pansexuality being rampant, polyamory, broken marriages, broken families, broken lives. I'm not gonna discuss in details what pansexuality and polyamory is. You can look that up yourself. Basically, um, the nucleus of the family is being destroyed from within. Broken lives, broken marriages, and so on. So many other um, outcomes and, and results, but I'm just giving you basically brief um, headlines, and then you can uh, uh, you can deduce what comes as a result of that as well. All right, just a quick check on time. Um, a couple of more attributes, a couple of more characteristics, and we'll move on. Number five, eight seconds visual attention span. Um, and and I'm not, I didn't come up with this eight seconds rule. This, is, this has been a, a result of, of years of, of research and study. Um, Gen Zers have eight seconds for you to capture their attention, visually speaking. If you don't, within the first eight seconds, you lost them. Now I can just go back to uh, um, Sunday school lessons, sermons, uh, preachings, um, Bible studies, all of the above. And again, this generation, they are visually um, stimulated. They need to, to they need to see things for them to, um, to to get their attention going. And you have eight seconds. It's all you have to deal with. Um, social media platforms like Vine, like YouTube, like Snapchat, they learned this and they advertised basically their um, their programs based on this eight second rule what's the word of the year for oxford dictionary in 2015 well the word of the year is actually that the laughing emoji uh, no more words because i have a limited i don't want to read a lot of texts how many of us as parents, I know this happens here in the West, in the US and Canada, um, you'll, you'll text your child with a complete sentence and the response will be, okay. As a matter of fact, now it's not okay, it's just K. Um, sometimes it's yes, no. Um, short to the point, as a matter of fact, sometimes they don't even respond, they will give you a quick emoji because that this emoji or this picture will basically describe their sentiment and their method of communication. This is the generation that, that, that we're, we're living in. And as, as servants, we need to, again, understand so that we can communicate, so that we can shepherd. Um, and as you can see on the screen, uh, uh, texts or text messages have been replaced with pictures. And, and that's basically the method of, and I just, I'll share with you something that's uh, humorous. I think, I thought it was interesting, the evolution of language. And this is um, sad to see, but it'll, you know, with mirth and laughter, let old wrinkles come. This is the expression of laughter, according to William Shakespeare in 
the 16th century. 1995, dude, that made me laugh. 2005, 2005, too funny, LOL. Now, it's not even a word that's used, it's just an emoji, and that's the evolution of language expressing laughter. All right, as a result, I think you can um, understand the result of this, of this characteristic. I'm bored quickly and easily. How many of us have teenagers that have heard this word over and over and over? I'm bored, I'm bored. Why? Because my attention span is, you, you didn't get my attention or, or, or capture my attention within the first eight seconds. Um, if I'm attending a liturgy that's four hours long, you can only expect the result is I am bored unless I am involved, engaged, taking ownership. I feel like this liturgy, I'm, I'm actually not just a spectator, but I'm also um, involved in, in, in worship and so on and so forth. My suggestion as I finish um, these um, these slides, my suggestion is, and this is what I suggested to the other um clergy seminars where I shared this presentation of Gen Z is for each church, either um, individually or, or collectively as a diocese, is, is to have more like work groups to discuss each of these characteristics and the results, the outcome, and do like a workshop. What do we do within our ministry, within our church, within our servants, in order for us to respond to each one of these characteristics or to each one of these outcomes rather, so that we can bridge that gap. What do we do? And do a brainstorming session in a workshop and come up with what now? I think it's, it's, um, uh, it is not very um, productive just to share the problem without offering the solution, but the solution can be developed again collectively within each church or even diocese-wise. This is just a suggestion. Last, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go over, I'm going to skip this one, and I'm going to go over. Um, all right, maybe I'll, 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 I'll finish with, with, the, um, with this last attribute, individualistic. What do I mean? According to Ann Fisher, who's a columnist at Fortune magazine, she said that there is an individualistic emphasis amongst this generation. Gen Z is used, to, is used to having everything personalized just for them, from playlists to news feeds to favorites to product features of all kind. They're grown up expecting that. Everything is individualistically personalized for me. Well, if this applies to the world around me, this also applies to, this may also apply to Christianity and my church and my faith. So what do I, um, okay, let's forget this, uh, forget this. What do I expect as a result? Custom made Christianity. I want to basically create and um, uh, personalize rather the, um, the lesson, the, the method, the, the content, everything that's given to me from church. I expect this custom made basically package to be delivered to me. Um, lastly, and I'm not gonna get over, I'm not gonna go over this, I, I, forgive me, I know I said lastly before, but this, I promise you, this is the last couple of slides. Um, when it comes to religion, they tend to be spiritual, not religious. I am sure, sure many of you have heard this expression before. I have numerous times on college campuses. I am not religious, but I'm spiritual. What does that mean? Well, I, I tend to feed my, my spirit. By the way, spiritual, not in the Christian sense, but in the secular sense, which ultimately leads to what's called new age spirituality, which is simply a cafeteria approach. I call it the cafeteria approach. You pick and choose whatever suits you from all religions and you make up your own worldview. Um, and that's the result, new age spirituality. Um, 
and and um, the, the second set of slides I wanted to share with you is that they are apathists towards religion. Apathists, uh, apathism is actually a movement. I would also like for you to look it up, just like expressive individualism we discussed earlier. If you were to look up apathism, apathism here, apathism is more damaging to Christianity than atheism and anti-theism. You know, apathism basically says, I don't care, whatever. It doesn't matter. I am not engaged. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't have any preference, indifference. In Arabic, I don't care. Um, this, I will suffice with that. And um, I will um, stop now because I want to allow some time for, for a discussion. But I wanted to review with you. And you can um, uh, go, with, go over this with me as well so that we can review the attributes that we've discussed for, neck, for, uh, for Gen Z so that we can wrap up. Uh, we said that first, they are um, Wi-Fi enabled. They're live, they live their lives predominantly through screens, um, being screen agers, not teenagers. Um, they are multiracial, ethnically diverse, and promote pluralism and coexistence and so forth. They are relativists, truth, sin, hell, all of this do not exist. And they are gender fluid and sexually fluid and gender neutral. You, you, you do you, I do me. And this is kind of the, the mantra of this generation. We also said that they have the eight second visual attention span, um, not only short atten attention span, but also visual. And we said that they are individualistic. They like to personalize everything in their life. And, um, and ultimately, they are spiritual, not religious, and they tend to um, gravitate more towards new age spirituality. Uh, and I think the last thing we mentioned is that when it comes to religion, they are apathists. Two words I would like for you to um, uh, maybe research further, expressive individualism and apathism. And as, as, as servants, it's important for us to understand, again, as I said, this generation so that we can reach out to them, communicate with them, and gracefully, through the grace of God, shepherd them into the kingdom. Glory and honor be to God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Dr. George, for uh, an insightful and uh, thought-provoking presentation. I uh, would like to take the opportunity to welcome Sayyidina Mangelis, who joined us uh, during your session. Oh, Sayyidina, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know you joined, forgive no, me. I, I snuck in, I snuck in. <laughs> Always pleasant to see you, Sayyidina. Thank you, thank you, George, and thank you, Ashraf. Thank you, Sayyidina. Um, so we we are, um, I know that everybody was actually focused on on the presentation and the, the talk or the the information that was being given by Dr. Basilius, I've noticed that uh, there are a few questions coming in, or just a couple actually. So um, let me let me uh, share the first first question. Um, the first one says, uh, "Thank you. This is an amazing lecture. Thanks and God bless." Uh, how can we adopt diversity in Christianity while not being lost or swollen by it, please? Yeah, I think this is a great question. I think uh, diversity in Christianity was um, um, conveyed and communicated to us by, um, by St. Paul uh, when he said that within within Christianity, they are there, we have diverse gifts that we can use um, coming from the same um, source who is God. And, um, and then he, he spoke extensively, I believe in, in his epistle to the Corinthians on this, on this type of diversity. So that within Christianity, we are diverse because we're members of the body of Christ. And these members are diverse members. They have different functions different gifts, different talents. 
but that's it, it's a, it, the culture is not speaking so much about the diversity within the same group within the same body our culture especially gen zers are speaking about diversity of even of origin diversity of faith so christianity and other faiths as well so i, I think we need to understand what it, you know the, the importance of having diversity different functions to serve the same purpose which is the edification of the body of christ and when the body of christ is edified through his diverse or its diverse members then the head becomes glorified that's the you know the true meaning of diversity within within christianity thank you ashraf thank you george if i could touch on that it's um it is a struggle because i think you know i'm very committed to ecumenical work and work with other denominations um and it's a struggle because you do have this homogenous gen z and and, and others who now see no difference. So it's all Christianity, it's all the same. We find ourselves between two extremes. One is the homogenous gray mass of Christianity where we're all supposed to fit in this generic kind of Christianity and the other that will fit very tightly in its own space and demonize everybody else. And, and I think it's, it's important for us to strike a balance as servants of being able to speak, speak graciously about others while being firm in who we are. And, and the example I've, I've used quite often with you, and George, I'm sure you've heard me say this before, is, is the pendulum and the clock. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have a fixed point there, that pendulum moves at quite a pace and it stays. It can go up here, it can go over there. So if my pendulum is fixed as to who I am, I can experience different types of Christianity but I know who I am. Mm -hmm. If we start to move sporadically, and this is what happens where even some of our own young people in the new generations, they're not firm enough in their Coptic Orthodox identity and faith, and yet they start to move everywhere else, then it becomes confusing. And so we do need to present a model of Christianity that gives them ownership and belonging into their own identity, and then allows them also to recognize others with respect. And the one thing that George caught, and I'm sorry, George, I was, I've been on the road most of the day, but I caught a little bit of your presentation at the end. And it's the concept of liturgical practices or services generally. If, if younger people are not made to feel part of it, not engaged, not belonging, not owning, they will disengage, they will be bored. They will no longer relate to. And, and so we do have to do that. We have to look at how to not only get young people to church, because sometimes they come with their parents when they don't have to come with their parents anymore, they don't. But how do we genuinely make them feel engaged and belonging? I think that is really difficult. And it's going to take a lot more than what we've been doing before this, because as I'm sure George mentioned over over the presentation this generation is very different it's not better it's not worse it's just different mm -hmm. so we need to adapt the communication system and even the material that we give them mm -hmm. so that it's something that engages their their thought their imagination and it allows them to engage with the church and its practices Thank you, Seydna. Uh, there is another question coming. Um, the, quest, the, the questioner says, how do we support our youth to respect others while understanding that everything is not okay for them and to be committed to sticking to the narrow way in their own lives? It's a great question. I'd love to hear your, your grace. I'd love to hear your, your, um, your response to this, please. And I, go ahead, George, I'll, I'll, I'll catch up after you. <clears throat> All right. Um, so how do we, res, you know, basically respect others while they are different from, from us? Is this basically the, 
I'm reiterating the question. Uh, I'll read it again quickly. How do Please. we support our youth to mm -hmm. respect others while understanding that everything is not okay for them and to be committed to sticking to the narrow way in their own lives? Yeah, great. I think His Grace's example that he just mentioned would serve as a great answer to this question. Um, I need to build my own identity. I think well, tomorrow's session will help for me to understand, uh, you know, the essentials of my faith. Who am I? Um, and and be anchored in who I am and what I believe in, what I'm convicted and, with, and all that, and um, and be able to uh, create this kind of um, uh, boundary, if you will, that. I, you know, I know where I end and when the other begins and where I begin when the other ends so that I know who I am and um, respect the other with, um, with their differences, with their, um, you know, St. Paul says, speak the truth in love. Well, I need to know what the truth is and I need to have this grace and, um, you know, this form of... Um, how shall I say this? Um, not compassion, but looking at the other as not their, you know, your enemy, but someone that you can work with, someone that you can um, shepherd, someone you can preach to. So I think the um, the question. I want to give a general answer to the question, but if you were to give me a specific situation. I can probably give you a better answer to that question. Um, and forgive me, it's, um, um, I'm, I'm like, I need, I need a specific example, if you may, and I'd love to hear your grace's response. Thank you, George. Again, I, I think it's um, what, I mean, let me go, go back a step. Um, I think most of you would know, I, I, I feel called to do a lot of advocacy work, to advocate for others. Uh, it started by looking at Christians in Egypt, up to Christians, then Christians in the Middle East, and then people of all faiths and none. And that's been part of my own journey in recognizing the importance of the image and likeness of God and the human dignity. And recognizing that every individual is a vessel of the image and likeness of God. Um, even if even if they have rejected him, they don't believe in him, they're an image and likeness of God. And I think as Christians, we need to ascend above the concept of tribalism. Mm -hmm. And and just, you know, I'm looking after my own or I'm just dealing with my own. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of our young people will talk about um how our church is not accommodating. And, and I think, George, you would have seen me address this in numerous times in North America, where I said that they are actually part of the problem because the young people themselves are not accommodating. In their parish communities, mm -hmm. very cliquey, they're very mm -hmm. tribal, they will stick with each other. Um, and now when we've got these echo chambers that are set up in closed WhatsApp groups, um, closed Twitter groups and Twitter followings and so on and so forth. You don't need to deal with anybody outside yourself anymore. You don't need to deal with anybody who's different to you. And so I think we need to make them see that as Christians, we see God in every person. Mm -hmm. But like we fall short of grace and make mistakes, that person can also make mistakes. So I was having this conversation with someone just yesterday. Um, she's, a, um, um, she's an Anglican, she works for the Church of England. Her, her husband is an Anglican minister. And we met yesterday and um, she was saying um, her position had changed on same-sex marriage. Um, because at one stage she was very, very traditional, one man to one woman for life. And then because she engaged with a colleague who said he was struggling with homosexuality, her view has changed. And I said to her that that was very indicative of us mixing up the person with the issue. 
we no longer look at issues, we look at people. And I think it's very, it's very dangerous. So we need to be able to look at the person in front of us, A, as the image and likeness of God, and so I must love him or her genuinely, not just sound bites, genuinely love this person, genuinely do all I can to serve this person, but recognize that this person may or may not be doing things that are good or bad, right or wrong, just as I am. Mm -hmm. And so it, it avoids that generic assessment, of either everyone unlike me is bad or everyone, regardless of what they do is good. And, and we need to infuse a slightly more mature, sophisticated and godly way of thinking in their minds where he makes you know, the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, but he also despises sin and he leads us to repentance. Thank you, Sayyidina. Thank you, Dr. George. Um, there are uh, two more questions that came through, and I think uh, we, we, can, we can carry on until probably for another 20 minutes or so, but um, I'll, read, I'll read you other questions. Um, one that says, how, how can we help our youth with stress and time management from a Christian perspective? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> All right, Your Grace, I would love to hear your response to this. Again, if you... Um, I'll, I'll come in after you. Take, take give us your moment. wisdom, please. For the, for the next two days, I'm following you. This is... I'm here, I'm here to hear you. Um, um, wow, stress and time management. Well, I... I um, again, I, if, if I want to help my child, I'll just relate this. To, let's say my son is stressed and he can't manage his time. Um I will, you know, a, a problem well defined is a problem half solved. So, what is the root cause of his stress? Is it, um, you know, is it peer pressure? Is it, uh, is it education, academic, uh, social? So, I need to know what is the root cause. Where is the stress coming from? And I also, it's important for us to understand that the stage of when you say youth, I'm assuming adolescent, the stage that my child is, is going through, whether daughter or son, in, in, in adolescence is a very unique stage. It's a very fragile stage that is marked by uh, you know, mood swings, uh, stress, anxiety, depression. So I need to understand that. Um, one thing that I would love to share with you and as parents or servants, um, is, is not to add more stress on my child than he or she already has. Um, so, you know, I've, I've just last week, I got a question from a parent saying, my child doesn't respect me and, and he's always angry with me and how can I have him, uh, you know, give me the respect that I am due as, as his mother. And um, if, if we look at it this way, we're basically adding more stress, more damage to my child, not knowing that they are going through turmoil themselves. So it's important for us to be compassionate as servants and parents, to be compassionate, to understand, to empathize with what, with what they're going through and communicate with them, see how they can, how you can help them relieve that stress based on your knowledge of where it's coming from. Time management is this basically, um, it's an exercise that, that, that I do with my child. Um, I, I sit with them before every endeavor and I set priorities and time limits and, and follow up and so on and so forth. Being engaged in your child, entering into their world is key to understand the stressors, hence resolve them and to help them manage their own time. Thank you, George. Um, Anna, let me tell you, I, I learned to respect time from watching someone who respected time. Um, I learned to value time from some, watching someone who valued time. Um, and as you all know, I served with the late Pope Schnuder for, for six years. 
And I, sh I saw the way his holiness would deal with time, that there was no time wastage, it was valued. And I, I got to learn very quickly, uh, and this is something that I always share, that the greatest and most valuable commodity we have is time. Because it is irreplaceable. You know, if I lose money, if I lose a job, if I lose a property, if I lose anything material, it can be regained. Mm -hmm. Once this second passes, it can never come back. Mm -hmm. so, so time is our greatest and most valuable commodity. And because I saw him do that, I learned. And I think this is why mentoring, discipleship, it's, it's very important. And of course, as parents, you know, you have a major role in your homes, but the sad reality is sometimes children, younger people will look up to people who are other than their parents and take them as an example. And so as servants, we need to give them that example. So I think if we want to teach young people the value of time, then we have to show them that we value time. Mm -hmm. um, we can't be complacent. We can't start something 10 minutes later just because we can. Um, we can't, we can't um, uh, give an appointment and not turn up. We can't uh, tell them, promise them something and then not do it. Um, because the model they have at home they will replicate and the model they have in church and in service they will replicate so if they see me doing that then they will do the same thing and i think then once we have that sense of value of time and they see me dealing with it it also can take the stress element out because they see how i deal with things some of you may have seen over the last few days, this video that Thy Kingdom Come did on, um, on silence that they recorded with me uh, a few weeks ago. And I, I think Karim, if you could share it with everyone, that'd be helpful, just a link. Um, I genuinely believe that that time of silence in our day takes away the stress. It, it, it stops us from being involved in the hustle and bustle. It calms us down, it gets us to readjust, recalibrate, and then start again. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for us to be an example in how we respect time and then how we manage our own stress. Because it's one thing to tell people to do things, it's another thing for them to see us doing it and use it as an example. Um, so I think, I think it starts with us. If we start to feel it, and if we start to manage ourselves, then then um, it'll happen. And, and if you notice, for instance, households where there are calm parents, you, you end up generally, I don't want to generalize, but you'll have calm, calmer children. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to get up to mischief and not going to cause trouble, but but they will have a calm demeanor about them because that's what they learn, that's why, what they internalize, that's the, what the environment around them provides for them. Thank you. Uh, before the next question, there was just a comment from, from uh, one of the attendees saying, thank you very much, George. I would like to ask if uh, we should add to the list you shared the increase in mental health awareness and issues in Gen Z. Yes, um, that's um, it, it, that's also another attribute that could be. I think there are fifteen altogether, and I think that's one of the fifteen characteristics. I'll be more than happy to share them all with. Uh, I can share them with you, Karim, and then you can disseminate that to to everyone else. But that is it's um, noted. I do agree with that, and it's included. Thank you, George. Uh, the, the next question is about um, something relating to what you said early that that actually the the growth by which youth are going through these days is is humongously quick and the question is how do we deal as servants with our youth growing up so fast and sometimes they may even exceed um 
our knowledge or our, our, our ability to catch up? Yeah, well, it's if my child grows, I must grow with him. Um, and that's just the only way I can catch up. And as I said, again, previously, you know, the only way I can uh, uh, penetrate his mind and heart is to enter, again, I use this expression, enter into his world and keep educating myself. You know, sessions like, like this session of understanding Gen Z, educating myself as to what do they go through? How do they feel? How do they react? So growing with them is essential for me to, to, to continue to communicate with them. Um, and and um, one thing I would also mention is that you, you as a parent will need to change your, your position and, and, and your, your, your job. So in the beginning, early years, you were a manager of your child. When your child grows into the adolescent stage, you'll need to fire yourself before they fire you, and you'll need to reapply back as a consultant, not a manager. So, so, so it's a different shape, um, completely different function that you have to, different role that you play in your child's life. As a consultant, you're not managing, managing them on, on a daily basis, taking them here, dropping them off, driving them here, uh, making things for them. You're there to consult for them. Um, and grow with them, and and um, that's the only way you can catch up. It's nice of you to say manager, George. It's more like crisis manager and driver, <laughs> personal assistant. That's what I do. <laughs> um, but but I also want to want to follow up on that because the most successful parenting models I have seen are the ones that start engaging with children at a very young age and building a relationship from that young age. Mm -hmm. It's not a chore, it's not, I've got to take you to football again, or I've got to go to music class again. Um, it becomes a, a, a real relationship and open the doors, open the channels for communication because the last thing you can do is start to engage with an adolescent young person at the time when they are most turbulent, their lives are upside down. They, they, they can't even deal with themselves, let alone you. Mm -hmm. But if the relationship starts early, and as George says, it evolves, relationships evolve. It, 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 you go from uh, being the protector to the guide, to the empower, to the enabler, to the, to the colleague, to, you know, to, to the, to the, to the companion and, and it, it goes through those stages and I think that is the most organic way to build a relationship otherwise um, they do I mean I, just to give you an idea for instance those of you who have um, children in adolescent age um, look at how many times you need to buy them clothes because their sizes are changing every few weeks and that's how much their personality is changing. That, and we need to keep adjusting and readjusting with that. Uh, we wonder why, you know, we dealt with them, they were fine six months ago, why aren't they fine today? Because he's different or she's different six months down. And so we're dealing with a different person with a different dynamic, with a different mindset. So we need to move in the same direction. Yes, and, and um, not to add to what you said, Your Grace, but just one thing also is to, to, to look at your child and see how they see you as a parent. Are you the one who always lectures and um, give the do's and the don'ts and, and um, you know, set the boundaries and set the rules and the enforcer of the rules and all that? Is this all you do? Some parents, the only way to communicate with their children, uh, or they communicate only by lecturing and sermonizing and, 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 and so on and so forth. If that's the only way, then you can assume that uh, once you basically open your mouth, they're closed their ears and their minds. So you need to see how they see you, as, as, as His Grace said, as 
as the enabler, the companion, or the lecturer. So we need to do more of one, less of the other. And I think also, George, um, you know, I, I think when we're speaking this way in this sort of forum, it's all very clinical and neat, but you are going to have to enable one day mm -hmm. and then, you know, put up boundaries the next. And we've got to be ready to do that. It, it doesn't sort of flow in these very nice uh, packages of time. Just like any of us, we will feel, you know, today I'm, I'm feeling a bit down. I need someone to encourage me. Tomorrow I'm feeling a bit arrogant and need someone to bring me down a bit. And I think it's it, it, Excellent. that responsiveness in the relationship is important. Love it. Thank you. Um, one question that um, talks about, um, George, what do we do with the I don't care attitude? <laughs> what, what, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, um, see, I, I, uh, one time I was um, at a conference and um, a clergy conference and one of the priests said, what, you know, what's the, uh, I mentioned, you know, what's the greatest, two greatest challenges, I believe, that will face, certain, or two problems amongst our youth. I said, ignorance and apathy, ignorance and apathy. So when you ask someone, uh, you ask a youth, what's the problem with this world? They will tell you, I don't know, and I don't care. That's basically what it is. It's ignorance and apathy. How do you Fix the first, and how do you fix the second? I'll 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 tell you both. Obviously, um, you fix ignorance, or you treat respond to ignorance by educating, teaching, um, and so on. Um, apathy, I believe, can be um, remedied by I think one thing: relevance. That's what I would say, relevance. If, if the church is relevant to me, you will, I will not be indifferent. I will be engaged. If the servant is speaking my language, and I don't mean English, I mean my cultural language, then I will feel that he or she can connect with me. There's some relevance. I have, um, I, I want to participate because it's relevant to me. They're speaking my language. They're, they're, you know, they're, I can relate to them. So again, relevance, relevance is, is very expansive, but we can dissect it into what can we do so that we can appeal more to this cohort and so that we can relate more to them and they will become, and we will become relevant to them. Thank you, thank you, George. Say that um, you are muted. Sorry, is that better? Thank you. Um, absolutely, George. I think relevance is is incredibly important um, as individuals and as a church. And, and, and I think when I've been speaking to the fathers and the Buna Michael is with us on the call, um, I've always said that the church must be relevant, must have a function. Um, People have choices now. Uh, people have a mindset of, of being service recipients. You know, when you're at an airport and you say, uh, "We know you have a choice in airlines. Thank you for thank you for choosing us." It, it's that's the same thing. We know you have a variety of things you can be doing. Thank you for choosing to come to church. And I think if we're not relevant, then then they will not care. Uh, if it doesn't directly touch their hearts, touch their touch their lives, then we're going to have a difficult time trying to keep it with any meaning for them, uh, because they will, you know, as we've heard earlier, they will switch off very very quickly if they don't think something is relevant. Uh, we used to do three minute videos, um, and we did some statistics towards the end and found out that within ma major demographics, people actually started to drop off at one minute 50. 
Um, and so we cut the videos down to two minutes because even three minutes was too long. And I'm, I'm just as guilty. I mean, forget Gen Z. I'm, I'm just as guilty. When I get a video, the first thing I look at is how long it is. I'll watch the first bit and then I'll scroll towards the end and I'll watch the last bit. And it's terrible. And, and that, that's me who is supposed to have, you know, a, a, a focus and a tolerance that is much greater, but it, that's, it's not necessarily the case. Thank you, Sidney. Thank you, George. Um, I think there are only two final questions. Um, the first one says, how can we support our children while they see the church as sexist? I would like to defer to his grace to respond to this question, please. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sayyidina. I appreciate it. I owe you one. <laughs> um, by us not being sexist, really. I mean, I think, I think we, we've got to differentiate between our practices and the attitudes of people within the church. So I, I don't think our theology is sexist. I don't think our liturgical life is sexist. Um, of course, there are things like, you know, baptism of 40 and 80 days um, when women can and can't have communion. I don't think that's sexism. I think that is just us being locked in a traditional teaching that in my opinion, I've said it to the Holiness, I've said it to the Synod, and I'll say it publicly to you, must change. It must change over time. And, and I think it will. Um, but then in our practices, you know, how, how do we do things? Um, so for instance, I'll let you in on one little nugget. Um, during COVID, of course, because of family bubbles, we've been seating people together. Now, I, I've, I've wanted for years, and we've been doing it at St. Paul's, but I wanted for years across parishes to get families to sit together. Um, and I think that I've spoken to the fathers about this, that even post COVID, I don't envisage us going back to men and women sitting separately. This is done, that bridge has been crossed. You know, people were uncomfortable with it. By the time we have to go back to any sort of normality, it'll be a year and a half, possibly two years. Khalas, it's done. The reason is one of the complications of that is something that we've always seen as administrative organizational but some women have brought up to me, why are you doing it? Why are you being sexist? And that is, so why do men have communion first? It's just organizational. Someone has to have communion first. And for us, it's easy. So when I'm giving communion, I can, I can tally in my head, the church is probably 50% men, 50% women. If I give men first, I can ration the communion properly. But it's a real, you know, and the fathers will know when you're giving communion the way we do it now, it's much more difficult because you, you can't ration it well. But that thing that we saw as organizational, others saw as, well, this is sexist, why men first? And I think the world is changing. Um, you know, we've been hearing lots of reports about the BBC in the last couple of days and how it's dealt with, you know, journalism and, you know, what happened. 25 years ago is no longer happening because people's perceptions change, people's expectations change. And I do think our own community, the expectations are changing. Um, you know, we, we must have more women in more positions. You know, when I, when I was setting up our diocesan trustee board, I made sure that it was 50% women. Not because we want token women, but because I've got 50% really good women who need to be there and who can fulfill a purpose and have skills. Um, so we, we need to figure out how to do that properly. And we need to go beyond our comfort zone and look at 
perception. Uh, perception, in many cases, is much more important than reality. And if people are perceiving us to be sexist, then we must figure out why. And if we can address it, then address it. But I don't think we can have a blanket statement that the church is sexist. I, I don't think it is. Uh, our, our Lord certainly was not sexist. His teachings were not sexist. Um, his, his incarnation for the whole world was not sexist. His calling all to salvation was not sexist. Um, our implementation must also, as we were saying, evolve. Again, not, not talking about doctrine, I'm talking about implementation. It must evolve. We now have, you know, maybe not 50 years ago, we now have more educated women who are working, who have skill sets that they may not have had back then, who will be able to give, who will be able to do things. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to look at that and to make sure that we're not just doing the same thing we've always been doing because it's easy, but intentionally look at evolving the way we do things. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Time, we, we have got, we've got about five minutes, time for one final question. Um, the, quest, the questioner said, uh, how can we be religiously sound and politically correct at the same time? Um, good question. Um, I have a saying that goes, politically correct is most often biblically corrupt. Um, political correctedness, I mean, the, um, especially here, here in the West, is, is to be tolerant not only of individuals as created human beings in the image of God with dignity and all, but, but, um, but to be tolerant to their ideals, to their behaviors, to their lifestyles, endorsing it celebrating it, promoting it. Um, and, and, and that's, that's kind of the, the hidden meaning behind political correctedness. It's another fancy name for being tolerant of behaviors, ideologies, and lifestyles. So instead of being hung up on the, the terminology, let's go to the, the substance, the essence. I, um, I teach my child what is true and what is false based on um, biblical teachings. What does the Bible say? This is my reference point. Um, what, does the, what, what does our Lord Jesus Christ say to, you know, in ref, you know, regarding this issue or that issue? Um, back to what His Grace mentioned is that I need to recognize our differences and me being different from someone else doesn't mean that we must be enemies. I can understand my faith, understand my truth, be biblically grounded, churchly guided, yet um, respect, maybe appreciate the differences in someone else, but draw this line where I will tolerate the person, love the person, respect the person, uh, yet cannot tolerate their behavior, their ideologies, their worldviews, if they contradict with what I know to be true according to the scriptures. And the model that was given to us is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was the, the most tolerant of all religious leaders when it comes to extending love to others. But when it comes to truth and falsehood, right and wrong, sin and righteousness, he was not tolerant at all. And that's because he loves them. And George, I, I agree. I think the word, once you say politically correct, it all, already has a negative connotation. It's like you're not speaking truth. You, you, are, not, you, you are almost blurring the edges. I think, as, and, and as, as George said very rightly, let's forget the rhetoric and let's talk about the core of it. As Christians, we are meant to be gracious. We are meant to speak truth. 
that we are meant to speak graciously and kindly. Powerfully, in truth, but graciously and kindly. And that's not political correctness. You know, and, and wisdom as well is important. Um, I remember, again, I keep going back to Pope Shenouda, but I remember one thing that um, he said to me, I've never forgotten. Um, we were talking about a priest who had made a mistake by writing something down. And, um, and he said, you know, whatever is thought need not be said. Whatever is said need not be written. And whatever is written need not be published. And so I think there is wisdom in what we say and how we say it. The fact that I decide not to say something is not political correctness. It is wisdom in that situation. As long as I'm being honest and as long as I'm being um, um, faithful to my view, I think it's very important. Our Lord tells us to be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. He himself, as George said, um, embraced the scribes and Pharisees at times and called them a brood of vipers at others. And so it is very, very important for us to learn how to speak and when to speak and why to speak. Um, and one thing I was saying to our apologetics group, uh, I, sorry, to the outreach and evangelism group, is when we're speaking, it is not about winning an argument. It's about winning a soul. We may lose the argument. And so what's important is how I present what I mean and how I say it and why I say it. Um, bottom line, graciousness and kindness. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, George. Um, uh, the final comment, George, that came through said, uh, do you know of any churches or any resources uh, that churches that are creating, engaging Sunday school material in the Coptic church? Yes, several here in the United States. <laughs> and I can, um, I can share them with you, um, Ashraf, um, offline, if, 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 um, if possible. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Ashraf, just to point out as well that in the diocese, we've got a group that's looking at Sunday school curricula, which is looking at all of the Sunday school curricula around the world and trying to incorporate it. So we have uh, Southern, Southern Diocese, and they've had done a huge revamp recently, and they've mm -hmm. got a lot of very good material. Toronto, St. George's, St. Therese in Toronto, also have very good material. Surprisingly, actually, a lot of people are uh, liking um, the, the things that, that are coming out in Arabic from the Bishopric of Youth in Egypt. And so what we're doing in the diocese is bringing all those together and formulating our own curriculum. Of course, this was all slowed down a bit by, um, by COVID, but by God's grace, we should try to have some things out. But George, if you have resources, please share them. That would be really helpful. Wonderful. I'll, I will do that. You, you mentioned a couple say that, that I know, and there are, are a few others that I will, I will share with you as well. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, it's, uh, we, are, uh, we passed our time by five minutes. Uh, as I'm talking, um, I've noticed that another question popped in. I think that is just for uh, Sayedna Mangelis, George. So uh, Good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the liberty and, and, and extend the time by another two minutes, but uh, quickly, Mangelis. Um, the question says, children during the corona period moved away from the church and remained bored during the mass. Is it possible that we would start and return to the service of Sunday schools again and quickly be face to face? Also, can there be activities for them during the summer period? Thank you, Ashraf. So yes, that, we, we've been thinking about that for the whole time. We just had a meeting. Uh, we have weekly clergy meetings and we're now having weekly meetings of our diocesan response group, the uh, COVID response group. Um, 
where we were just discussing the resumption of services now. We're, we're, we're calling them fellowship services, uh, ranging from children's Sunday school all the way through to senior citizens, <laughs> retired and semi-retired people. Um, so yes, we do definitely want to start those again. We think if things keep going the way they are, then uh, we are probably looking at um, the next step, which is post June 21st. Um, we're already working on guidance. So we had a meeting and we're working on guidance uh, on um, the resumption of services, what it looks like. Of course, we also need to realize that it's going to be a hybrid. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm seeing a question about services outside. Um, so at the moment, we're encouraging, you know, groups to potentially meet in open spaces for the next few weeks um, to, to, to be able to, to do different things. Um, the, the guidelines now are up to 30 people outdoors. Um, but we also need to realize that there are some people who still are not going to be happy um, to go back. And so we have to have a, a, an online element of that so people don't miss out. So it doesn't mean we have two separate services, one in person, one online, or do we have a hybrid of both? It, it's, we're just trying to do all of that now. What, all, what we also don't want is just to push the button and do things and have to go back on them. So we're trying to take things very slowly, but we do understand uh, it's going to be difficult and more than that, just so you know, we are um, putting together a group um, in the diocese for, you know, post-COVID recovery. So what is service going to look like post-COVID? What are the things we have to deal with? Um, what are the things that didn't exist before that now exist and how do we deal with them and how do we move people forward? Uh, so all of that, it's all happening in the background um, and we will communicate all of that to you as soon as we possibly can. Thank you, Zedna. Thank you, George, very much for your time. And um, just a quick reminder of tomorrow's session. We are meeting, uh, God willing, at 7, 7 p.m. to talk about the next uh, part of the series, which is now that we understand the characteristics or the challenges of um, this generation. How do we succinctly and 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 clearly communicate the the basis of, of our faith? Um, thank you all for participating and taking time. Uh, Saidna, would you bless us? Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering who, who prayed at the beginning. Anyone prayed at the beginning? Uh, Abuna Michael. Abuna Michael. Abuna Yohanna, I see that you're with us. Abuna Yohanna, can you hear me? No. Abuna Yohanna. Qabili diki Sayyidna. Rabbi khalik Sayyidna. What's that? Salli lana tukhtana na fadlak? Ma astahiga Sayyidna, salawati. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, from all our hearts, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who guide us, who protect us, who teach us how to live in this world, not to resemble the, the people of the world, how to be different, how to be your witnesses, how to be your children of God as a light in this world. All one would need is, as you said, Lord, that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will guide you and he will teach you. Please strengthen us, protect us, and guide us by your Holy Spirit. We all need your Holy Spirit to guide our lives according to the will and according to the plan which you wanted for every one of us. Not just for us, but for the whole world as you are looking and seeking the salvation of everyone in this world. You loved everyone, Lord. So we ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, to shine your light 
in the heart of everyone in this generation, in the next generation, in, in everyone who is far away from your words, the words of life, the words of eternity. We ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, to surround us with this love and this protection till we reach our destiny, the, etern- the kingdom of God, the eternity to be with you. Protect us and protect all your children and all the servants, everyone. We need you, Lord, to be in the heart of every one of us, including my weakness. Amen. Accept these prayers, Lord, of our hearts and our mouths. Bless this evening for us. We ask your blessings upon your son, George, and his family and his ministry, that you may continue to reward him for his faithfulness. For all my sisters and my brothers, who are serving for my fathers in their families and communities and congregations. The intercessions of our Holy Virgin Mother, Mary, your angels and archangels, the prayers of all your saints, the blessings of your holy resurrection. Hear us and we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Ashraf, for doing that so masterfully. Thank you, Sidna. Yes. Uh, before we go, Abu Khanam, can you leave your camera on for a minute? Thank you. And Rami and Rania, we can't see you. Bring the camera down a bit so we can see you, because Karim is going to take another screenshot for us. Thank yes, you. Sure. Everyone, best side. <laughs> Thank you, Karim. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah, George. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sayyidna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.